All right, thanks, uh, Samir, for joining us. Um, I guess many of you know what uh, Funding Circle is, but for the benefit of those who might not know so much about the uh, company, uh, could you give a brief introduction? Yeah, sure. So um, for those of you that don't know, Funding Circle is the largest online small business lender um, in the Western world. Um, we've um, originated um, over $5 billion of loans um, to thousands of businesses across the UK, US, Germany, and the Netherlands. Um, we provide a platform, um, so we don't actually lend any money ourselves, um, but we allow anyone, so governments, um, individuals, people like all of you, um, institutions, um, to kind of bypass the banking system and lend money, and that means that Investors get access to stable, attractive returns, typically of 6 7% a year. Um, and small businesses get access to fast, low-cost loans. And you guys have come a long way um, in the past few years. And when you started, you had an interesting setup. Uh, none of you were CEO. And I guess now you're the CEO. Uh, how did that come about, and, and how did that work? Yeah, so um, we were three co-founders when we, we started the business. Um, and as many people do, you know, we were friends from university. It was very difficult to decide who would, um, who would be CEO, to be honest. So we just kind of said, well, we'll all be CEO, and that's fine. Um, and then uh, Index Ventures became an investor in the business um, and said, look, this, this kind of system doesn't work. And I think we, we already were starting to see that you know, it doesn't quite work when you've got lots of different people doing things. So um, in the end, it was, it was a bit simpler than others maybe because, um, you know, the business was originally my idea and I had a slightly larger ownership um, than, than the others. But um, it's always worked quite well, actually. We've never really questioned it, maybe because the business has gone well and uh, we all get on well and we've all been friends. Um, but I think um, it was definitely a benefit to... Yeah, having one of us as, as CEO. And the timing of when you founded Funding Circle is, is quite interesting. So you founded the company in 2010, um, right after the financial crisis. Uh, banks were sort of retreating from uh, small business lending. Um, how has the market changed since you got started? Yeah, so when we started Funding Circle, it was in the middle of what was certainly the biggest recession of our lifetime. and. Um, you know, we were doing a lot of work on it, but it was quite scary because we, we had jobs. Um, some of our friends were losing their jobs. You know, it was, it was quite a big deal at the time. Um, and when we, when we came to the point where we wanted to start the business, um, we basically worked out that it wasn't regulated. So we talked to lawyers and people, and, and they said to us, hey, um, just send a letter to the regulator. If you don't hear back, it's fine. Just, just go and start the business. And obviously, you know, we didn't really want to quit our jobs in the middle of this massive recession to, to, to do that um, without. So we, we kind of hounded the regulator until we got an answer. Um, and even then, it was a pretty scary period. You know? And I think what you've seen since then in small business lending is you know, there's been a huge continuation of this trend, which is whereas in consumer lending, banks have actually come back into the market. Consumer lending is actually at a higher level now than it was during the crisis. In small business lending, banks have retreated massively, and they, they've continued to do so. So actually, there's this huge gap still in the market um, for what, you know, and I'm not talking necessarily about the business, small businesses that might be here, you know, tech-enabled. These are very much restaurants, pharmacies, small manufacturing firms, you know, the kind of real core of the economy that needs capital to grow and expand. They're not going to treble every year or do all the amazing things as everyone else is doing. But but they need that, that, that money, and that, that actually is really starving the economy everywhere, Germany as well, of, of growth. And one of the ways that, that you compete is by your use of data. So you, you use data in interesting ways um, in this marketplace. So you know, what, are, what are some of the ways that you've been using data, and, and what are some of the lessons uh, from that program? Yeah, so I think um, when we've started our business in every single market, um, every single country, in the first two years, the loans don't perform quite as well as we want them to. And part of the reason for that is small business lending is really, really hard. 
It's not like consumer lending where you can just kind of take a bureau score or something and just do it. You actually ha have to aggregate huge amounts of data to really get predictive. But the really nice thing is once you've actually been able to go through that kind of R&D phase, um, you can really start to use data in, in pretty amazing ways. So um, you know, right the way through, right from targeting, um, we, we use a lot of data to determine which businesses to target in terms of online advertising, uh, you know, email advertising, even stuff like TV now, you can target people right the way through to propensity modeling on when a borrower starts to apply. We have a good sense for how quickly they need that money, how quickly they need to be called. So we use machine learning to determine which borrowers to call first so we can give some borrowers an expedited process. Some, are, some don't need as much time. Um, credit models, everything. So once you actually start to get into this data mode, you can really apply these tools and techniques in very innovative ways. And one of the things I've said quite often, which not many people seem to listen to, is you know, banks are very, very regulated companies. And they're regulated for good reason. You know, if a bank goes bust, we as taxpayers ultimately have to stand behind them. You know, we're, we're funding these schemes, these deposit reinsurance schemes. So regulators are not going to let banks use the latest uh, tools and techniques in terms of machine learning, especially stuff like deep learning. Um, it's actually going to happen in places outside the uh, banking system, fintechs, asset managers, people like that. And that's a huge opportunity for, for not just us, but for everyone here, is that um, you can actually use things that banks fundamentally won't be allowed to use. And regulation cuts both ways, right? Um, a lot of other startups um, don't have to deal with the regulated environment um, that you have to deal with at Funding Circle. So what, um, what are some of the things that you had to do differently or, or, or some of the key decisions that you had to make along the way given uh, the regulated environment that you're operating in? Yeah, I think there's a few things. So, um, so we are a regulated business. Um, you know, we're, uh, we, we don't lend money ourselves. We don't guarantee returns and things. So we're a bit more like an asset manager than, say, a, a bank. Um, but I mean, there's a couple of things. So we look after people's money. You know, we've got 5 billion of uh, money. We've got 80,000 retail investors, individuals with money on the platform. That means when you hear stuff like, you know, move fast and break things, the kind of original Facebook stuff, you can't really do that kind of stuff because if you lose people's money, you know, that's kind of the end of the business. So you need to kind of take a different approach to the money parts, the kind of bits where people really care about things to other stuff like, for instance, like on the borrower side, split testing application forms, things like that. We're quite happy to move fast and break things there. But in certain parts of our business, they just need to work all the time. Everything, all the money needs to add up. People don't want to lose, lose money. And the second way we've done it is we've tried to instill uh, re unprecedented transparency in our business. Um, we publish every single loan um, that we've done on our platform in a spreadsheet so people can analyze the performance in real time. With our staff, we're regularly communicating everything about the business. And one of the things I think that went wrong in the crisis with banks was no one knew what was going on inside these things. You know, they're so big, so complicated. Whereas if you make your business model super simple, you know, at the end of the day, Funding Circle is a very, very simple business. People are lending, to, lending money to small business borrowers. That's, that's as simple as it gets. It, ha it used to happen even before banks existed. And you make everything very, very transparent about it. It's very hard for people to do bad things or for things to go wrong because it's, it's pretty much all out there. And when you talk to people uh, about Funding Circle, one of the things that comes up a lot is culture. And uh, I'm sure a lot of the folks in the room would be very interesting to he interested in hearing kind of how you've built a sort of culture that's both inclusive and fun, but also very oriented around kind of hard work and, and going the extra mile. So um, what are some of the things that you've done to, to build that culture? Well, I mean, I think we've, uh, we care about it a lot, which, which obviously makes a difference straight away. You know, I'm, we've worked in environments where probably culture wasn't as an important a thing. Uh, you know, traditionally in finance, you know, people just pay you lots of money and they don't really, and they kind of tell you to get on with your work, really. 
and you don't really know what's going on. It's very, you know, that this culture of transparency is because I saw in lots of institutions I've worked in, like you don't know what's going on, and if you don't know what's going on um, as a as a kind of employee or a, you know, you feel very very disempowered. So, lots of things from you know, straight away, you know, I mean, look, this is obvious stuff in some respects, but like monthly bonding, you know, going out all the time. We started doing this when we were six employees. You know, we have 900 employees now, but we still will go out every month and do an event in all our different geographies. Um, I mean, it gets bloody expensive after a while, but it's, um, it's the kind of stuff that people, people really value. Making the whole thing about values. So, you know, in Funding Circle, we have, we have five values. Um, we try to keep it less than, I think, a lot of other people. A lot of people have 14, 10 values. I kind of think, if you've got so many values, why do you care you know, if you can't remember these things, if it's not part of what you do? And making it integral to everything. So we compensate people not on just their performance, but actually how they meet our values. You know, being open, transparent is one of our values. You know, we want our business to be a very transparent business. We want people to readily share information. We reward and penalize people if they don't do that. So, so you need to kind of make it central to everything you do. Otherwise, yeah, people just don't care. That why would you care if, if, you know, if you know you can just perform and you're still going to progress and things like that? I was Ping Pong Fight Club. So I hear you have some data scientists that are nationally ranked ping pong players. Yeah, so we, um, we, we compete in a competition in the UK. It's called Ping Pong Fight Club. Um, we tried to bring it to the US, but you know, I think people didn't like it because we just won it and um, they didn't want to play anymore. Um, but um, I think it's quite nice because what happens is, I mean, we lost the last one, which would be annoying, but like, we, we turn up with 100, 200 people from Funding Circle. We're always the best supported uh, team. And in, when you do a platform business like us, it's a bit like the kind of Amazon's, uh, you know, Just Eat type business models where you have to be number one. You know, if you're not number one, you know, when you're the biggest lending platform, investors want to come to the place where there are the most loans, the most stable returns. Borrowers want to come to the place where they're most likely to be accepted. They get the fastest loan. The data, you know, the person who has the most data can do the most innovative stuff. So what I kind of tell the team is like winning and being number one is not just this kind of thing we say because we're competitive. You know, it's our business model. We have to be number one in a market. Otherwise, we won't, we'll lose. And, uh, you know, in certain categories of business, I know food delivery is one, only the number one player actually makes any money. The number two doesn't, doesn't ever make any money. So like the table tennis stuff is, is kind of silly in some respects, but it, it kind of reinforces this notion that we have, which is, you know, winning is our business model. We, we have to be number one. It's the most important thing um, about what, what Funding Circle is. And if we go into a market, we don't go in to be, you know, a lot of people were surprised when we went to the US. We've ended up as number one. People said, oh, you know, you can be number three, number four. You know, you have to be number one. If, if you're going to enter these things, you, you have to play, play to win, basically. And connected to your culture, you've done something quite interesting when you've acquired um, other companies where you've uh, t you know, taken the founders of those companies and, and made them co-founders of, of Funding Circle. Can you um, kind of explain how that's worked and, and, and what the thinking behind that is? Yeah, I mean, it's worked well with, um, with some co-founders, with, with others it doesn't. I mean, it's a very interesting thing. Like, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are entrepreneurs. Um, you know, we acquired um, a couple of companies to enter different, different geographies. Um, and it is quite difficult to, um, you know, integrate people who are entrepreneurs. You know, people don't, if you're an entrepreneur, do you really like working for someone else? I, mean, I know I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't like doing that. So we try to create an environment where we get the best of global. So we have a very matrix organizational structure. We have a lot of global functions where we can really add a lot of value. So stuff like data, technology, areas like risk management, marketing. But then we try and give local geographies a lot of freedom to execute. We try and make people feel like they're still part of a very entrepreneurial company. Because when you're in a new country, you know, like um, we're, we're the biggest lending platform um, for small business in the Netherlands and Germany, but that's a lot smaller than, say, our UK business or our US business um, at the moment, growing much faster but smaller. So we don't want to stifle these new geographies with things like that. So 
I think it's a nice way of doing it. It's not without its challenges. Um, but if you want to maintain the kind of entrepreneurial drive of co-founders when you acquire companies, you've got to kind of think quite deeply about this kind of stuff. And uh, Index Ventures just published uh, a piece about rewarding talent, about how you know, entrepreneurs should think about um, options pools and rewarding employees to attract the best talent. What's your thinking on kind of granting options and, 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 and what, what have been some of your key learnings in that area? So we have always given options to every single employee in our company. Um, I think it's really important. Um, I think when you stand up in front of people and you talk to them, and if you want them to care about this kind of stuff, you know, they have to be owners. They have to feel part of the success. They have to understand it. Um, you know, we've been doing that you know, right from day one. We continue to do it. It's important to us as a business. Um, and you know, I think a very large portion of our, our business is owned by, by employees. I mean, I have noticed cultural differences. In the US, um, this is a very uh, you know, well-trodden path. People, if I look at my kind of um, you know, uh, uh, employees in my business, like people, people in the US really understand it. They really value it. I think that's starting to change in Europe, um, certainly continental Europe. But people still say sometimes to me, hey, I'd rather have a bit more pension or, you know, rather this, and I'm like, look, you guys are crazy. This thing's going to be worth loads of money. So, but I think, think things are changing. And ultimately, I think you have to kind of do what you know is right in the long run, which is for people to be owners and, you know, kind of not acquiesce to this, just pay me a bit more money or things like that. Because I think in the long run, people will feel pretty pissed off if they're, if they're not part of the success. And very quickly at the end, what's next for Funding Circle? Well, I think we just want to keep growing and expanding. Um, you know, we've got this platform. We've ended up as the number one in all the markets we play in. You know, we're originating you know, $260 million a month now, so we're, we're the largest in the world. Um, and we want to keep adding more and more countries. And I think one of the things we've learned over the years is just to be relentlessly focused. You know, we do one product pretty much, in all, the same product in all our geographies. Um, and we're just going to keep rolling that out to more and more countries, but we're just going to get amazing at it. You know, if you do one thing amazingly well, that's when you can use all this machine learning, you know, deep learning, all this kind of stuff. If you try and do too many things, not. So we'll just keep doing one thing amazingly well in as many countries as we can. Please join me in thanking Samir for joining us. Thank you. Thanks.